You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but we got to let it breathe just for a moment here while we make sure we have connected with our entire Facebook community. Bear with us. And we are good. I'm your host, Chad Jansen. With me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him, you love him, Zach Elberman. Zach, last night the news breaks that inexplicably the Los Angeles Rams gave up Jared Goff, not one, but two first round picks, a third round pick for, nope, not Aaron Rodgers, Matthew Stafford. Zach, that's a that's a haul I would have expected for to command. Like, if you want to apply Aaron Rodgers off the Packers' hands, like that kind of a play is what I would expect. Been to the top of the mountain, perennial All Pro, multi time MVP, Matthew Stafford. I like it boggled my mind that the Rams were willing to part with that much capital. Well, like I mentioned on Kelberman's Corner earlier today, I think a lot of it was desperation. Obviously, uh, Sean McVay made it very well known after the season. He was tired of being held back by Jared Goff, and he wants not only Goff off the roster, but Goff's contract off the roster. But even if it was for Aaron Rodgers, Chad, it's a small window veteran quarterback that you give up all that capital and compensation for. The only player I would give it up that's reasonably available is Deshaun Watson. But even then... Multiple first round picks, a third round pick, a foundational player like Jared Goff, a twice a 4,600 yard passer. And this is what I was saying, all for a 10 year quarterback who's never won a playoff game. Matthew Stafford is going to be uh, 33 in a few days now. The Rams, that was one of the most lopsided trades I have ever seen in my entire life in any sport. And some people are rationalizing it like they're, they paid extra to, for the Lions to take golf off their hands. No, they way overpaid for someone like Matt Stafford. They got way desperate, and that was a way knee-jerk maneuver by Les Need and Sean McVay. But thank you, Sean. Thank you, Les, because it finally puts the Stafford to Denver notion to rest. It was never going to happen, nor is Deshaun Watson. I've been saying it for a while now. I've been cautioning since day one. Don't be surprised when it's Drew Locke and Andy Dalton in 2021. It wasn't for lack of trying, though, Zach. George Payton was in on that deal. Uh, There was, excuse me, that's the wrong one. Let me go back here. There was a uh, report from Mike Kliss, and then it was followed up by another uh, insightful report from Denver 7's Troy Rank. Let me me pull this up. This is uh, Mike Kliss last night. Quote, per sources, the Broncos were engaged in the Stafford talks. There were multiple proposals on the table, none near the haul that the Lions got from the Rams, Lions were interested in the Broncos' core of young players, including Drew Locke. Broncos' new GM, George Payton, was reluctant uh, to part with the young core, close quote. So, Zach, I've picked up a few things, and here's what I understand. The the Lions, they were interested in Drew, but they wanted Broncos' first, a a first-rounder, second, maybe a third, plus Drew Locke, plus, he, he goes on to say, part of young core, reluctant to part with young core, plus like a Noah Fant or a Jerry Judy or a Draymond Jones. Like that's what they were wanting, which makes you understand why Peyton said, "Eh, thanks, but no thanks. But he was relatively close and in on this. And it took the the Rams coming in kind of at the 11th hour after they had kind of felt everything out, saw what the Lions were after, kind of heard through the grapevine what other teams were offering. All right, let's slap together an offer that they can't refuse. Boom, got it done. So to me, I mean, George Peyton might be a little bit, you know, this time last night might have been a little bit disappointed that he swung and missed on on Stafford, but it's a blessing in disguise. This was a, a bullet dodged. I don't think he's disappointed. He said he's going to be involved in every deal, and he promised to be aggressive but not reckless. He was aggressive in offering reportedly a first-round pick and then some, but he wasn't reckless in offering what the Los Angeles Rams offered. And I want to just highlight really quickly this little comment. Lock and Dahl, another five-win season. I don't know why Zach wants that so damn bad. It makes no sense. I'm not telling you what I want. I'm telling you what's more than likely going to happen. George Payton told you himself he's aggressive but not reckless. He believes in stockpiling 
draft picks. He was never going to come in here being a rookie general manager and a first-year GM replacing Elway and giving up the farm or giving up most of the farm for 33-year-old Matt Stafford. That's just the way he operates. So again, it's not what I'm telling you where my heart is. I'm telling you where my brain is. And my brain right now has indicated for weeks that don't expect these blockbuster moves. Don't expect this wholesale roster turnover. Expect more of the status quo in 2021. The Broncos showed you their hand before even Peyton was hired, when they kept Fangio, and when Fangio kept McMahon, and when Fangio kept Pat Shermer. Status quo is the name of the game for 2021. You don't have to like it. You can rail against it. You can be sad, mad, miserable. It doesn't change that fact. That's all. We'll come back to it. There's so much about this, that uh, so much material here that we can kind of sink our teeth into. But what we got to do first is say hello and thank you to the presenting sponsor of tonight's live stream pod, Manscaped. Listen up, boys. 2020, put it in the rear view. It's behind us. It's 2021. And the best thing to move forward and put 2020 behind you is to embrace that new year, new me mindset. And what better way to do that than with Manscaped? Manscaped is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming, offering precision-engineered tools for your family jewels and helping 2 million men around the world keep their grooming on point. Zach, everyone knows I'm kind of partial to the Lawnmower 3.0, but we've been talking about it a lot on this podcast the last couple of weeks. But I'm also partial to refined cologne, the cologne that Manscaped offers. Yep. Yeah, and guys, no matter who the Broncos quarterback is uh, this season or going forward, you have to take care of yourselves. And where you start to take care of yourself is by manscaping. It's become a verb now. It's not taboo. It's not weird anymore, whether it's your unmentionables, whether it's like I use the nose hair trimmer, the ear hair trimmer. You want your face to look good. You want your body to feel good. And that's what Manscaped offers. I love the grip of it. I love the practicality of it. It holds a charge forever. Chad's going to show you in a second. It has a light on it so you can see everything. It's really a great product, and we wouldn't come on here and BS you. We use it every single day or most you know, every single day. Chad loves the cologne. I'm partial to the cologne. They have wipes. They have pads. They have nail trimmers. They have nose hair trimmers. They really have it all for any requirement, any need you have in male grooming. But I promise you guys, it's the real deal. Step your game up, boys and girls. And I know that, that uh, most dudes, for what it's worth in the, in the modern times, they're – they understand you got to you got to uh, be on point with with your male grooming, but this helps you take it to another level. Come out of quarantine right now with well groomed below the waist uh, with the lawnmower uh, lawnmower three point look. It's got the light. That's one of my favorite things. I'll use one of Zach's phrases, and that is that it helps kind of illuminate that undercarriage portion of your body. It's kind of hard to see when you're trying to take care of business down there. It's the safest one out there for those tender areas on your body. Lawnmower 3.0. So embrace the new year, new me mindset with Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code HUDDLE at manscaped.com. Your family jewels gang will thank you. Guys, get 20% off and free shipping with the code HUDDLE at manscaped.com. Again, that's free shipping and 20% off with the code HUDDLE at manscaped.com. Happy New Year to you and your family jewels. Amen. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, so real quick, I want to just come back to the point. um, I'm sorry, I missed the name of that last comment that you brought up there. We'll get to a few other matters of business here in a minute, but uh, that comment you brought up about Zach just wants us to go 6-10 and with Locke and and Dalton. This is just the the, the lay of the land. You know, I was having a conversation with uh, Black Knight 232 earlier today before we – went live with the huddle up podcast tonight. And I was explaining to him that as Zach said, you, it, they kind of telegraphed what they're going to do by not firing Fangio after Elway steps down. They had to make some changes. It's another five and 11 season. All right. Elway is going to relinquish the GM duties. He's going to move up and become president, but we're keeping Fangio. All right. In comes Peyton. This coaching staff is foisted upon him. And because of that, I don't think you're going to see him do anything to this year anyway to kind of upset the apple cart. I would be stunned beyond measure if the Broncos draft a quarterback in the first round. I do think, though, the only way they change what's going on at quarterback as far as Drew Locke is if they can procure a veteran today 
that will immediately allow them to to win. And I think that's what Fangio would prefer too right now is a veteran that can allow him to to maximize what is very much a hot seat year. Like it's a do or die year for Fangio. So you saw Peyton step into the Stafford talks and see what it might take to get that done. And as he said, we'll be involved in every deal. He was involved in that. Didn't mean he closed it down and it was Haven, Haven, Moses, Haven, Haven two Moses five. Uh, he was involved. He didn't quite close it. The Rams came in, let him take that deal. I mean, again, if it was for Aaron Rodgers, I could understand what they gave up, but for Matthew Stafford, it boggles the mind. Zach, the last thing on this tangent is I don't think Peyton's done tinkering with quarterback. I still think any and all veterans that could be within the Broncos grasp, whether it's trades, free agency, they're going to pursue, they're going to explore. But when it's all said and done, I still will be surprised if the quarterback starting for your Denver Broncos in 2021, day one, is anyone other than Drew Locke. And that might set some people back and and discourage them, but you got to imagine that he's going to take some kind of a step forward with having the same system two years in a row. That's what I would be hanging my hat on. He also kind of showed his hand as well. I mean, reportedly, George Payton did jump in there, and the Broncos were among the four or five finalists for Matthew Stafford, and they reportedly offered more than a first-round pick. So that says to me that they're not dead set on making Drew Locke the understood quarterback. But that's, Chad, we've been saying for weeks now. He was never going to be handed the job. He was always going to have someone either behind him or maybe in front of him. I always thought it was going to be a veteran backup. You have the young guy. You can still hope to salvage him, but you still have the failsafe who's not not named Jeff Driscoll, who's not named Brett Rippon. You have someone better behind him, whether that's a Dalton or a Fitzpatrick or a Foles or a Trubisky, but it's the best of both worlds. You mentioned something that's interesting, though, Chad. It's a hot seat year for Fangio. It's not a hot seat year for Peyton. That's why you, you normally see GMs and head coaches hired together. They normally get extensions around the same time together. They're always paired. They're always attached to the hip, and Fangio and George Payton are not attached to the hip. Fangio is in win-now mode, whereas George Payton has a complete honeymoon season. He's on full scholarship for this year. So if Fangio doesn't make the playoffs with the roster that Payton wants to give him, he'll be out. That's a tough position to be in. Rello wants to know who won the trade. I mean, seriously. Detroit. Big time. The Rams got bent over a barrel, all right? Yeah. Look, as I was writing this up last night, and basically as I I wrote it up because I wanted to report to our community and our readers, which – by the way, thank you again, everybody, for a phenomenal month. In January, over 2 million Broncos fans read our work at milehighhuddle.com. We love each and every one of you. But we have a responsibility to kind of pass this information on to our readers. And as I was writing that up, I'm just it was boggling my mind, Zach, that the Rams gave up not only Goff, who, for what it's worth, Goff's been in the league since, what, 2016? So he and he and Stafford, two former number one overall picks, separated by what seven eight years whatever it was Stafford in 09 he in in 07 or 17 16 excuse me so what was that so seven years eight seasons whatever it is plus two first rounders plus a third if you would have told me that was the deal that the Rams gave up in order to land Aaron Rodgers I would have been like I I understand it Matthew Stafford dude Jared Goff has two Pro Bowls under his belt he's been in the league far far uh less time half of the time pretty much uh, he's got a conference championship. Yeah, he got to the Super Bowl and lost, but he's got – I mean, he actually has way more, uh, many more skins on the wall than Matthew Stafford. It seriously – I mean, the pressure that Stafford is now under and McVay. I mean, this is a move that if you're McVay and you're uh, – what's what's the GM Sneed? Uh, yeah, Sneed. Sneed. Man, that trio is under some immense pressure to win now. And it's not going to be easy for that team, Zach, because – you got the Niners on the come. You, right. you know Kyle Shanahan is going to find a way to upgrade quarterback one way or another. They're going to get a lot of their healthy or injured guys back healthy this year. Plus, you still got Russ in Seattle, and you've got a uh, Arizona Cardinal teams, uh, Arizona Cardinals team on the come with That's Kyler Murray. Yeah, dude, I just don't foresee that. But it just doesn't bode well, in my opinion, for the Rams because Stafford has shown you who he is. He's been in the league. This is his thirteenth year. He'll be in the league game. I like his measurables. I like his arm. I like what he used to be, but he hasn't been that guy for a long time, and it's never come out in the wash for the Lions. Yeah, and they're really banking the Rams on winning a title with Stafford the next couple of years. And if there's anyone that can do it, though, Chad, it is Sean McVay. You know, he is an offensive mastermind, but 
if they would have gave up the two first rounders and all the draft picks, that would have been too much for Stafford. One first round pick arguably is too much for Stafford, but to throw in a foundational piece, let alone a young quarterback who might not even scraped his ceiling at in the NFL. You mentioned it perfectly. We've said it before. Stafford showed you who he is at this level. Jared Goff, I think the jury is still pretty much out. I understand he didn't make it with McVay. He's still young, though. You can mold around him. Stafford's 33. So by far and away, Detroit, by the way, the new Detroit GM was with the Rams. So he literally fleeced his old team in one of the most outlandish ways I have ever seen. That is a win for Detroit. They can go draft a quarterback now in the first round, or they don't have to. They can build around Jared Goff. Brad Holmes, the GM of the Lions, was one of the the best since the rookie Williams New Orleans trade, I believe, Chad. That was incredible. Yep. And look, I understand that, like, you know, if Nick Kendall was in this room with us right now, he'd be talking about, you know, the NFL is, is, has trended way more towards mobile quarterbacks with the arm that can, um, you know, can, can throw off different platforms and uh, improvise and all that. And that's definitely more to Stafford's skill set than Goff, who is, has really just made it clear and plain that he is a pocket player. If things break down, good luck. He's you're going to have problems. So you got to know that as as a coaching staff, you got to scheme to try and avoid that from happening. But nevertheless, I still can't see in any way, shape, or form how anyone could look at this trade and not think that it was the Lions that came out ahead by a mile, a long shot. Let's grab Kenneth Booker. Love you, my friend. Good to see you. Uh, he says uh, if we draft Micah Parsons, the linebacker out of Penn State, and sign David, where talking about Levante David. Where would our linebacker core rank? We would have Von Miller, Parsons, David, and <laughs> Chubb. Awesome. Dude, if you had that quartet, oh man, you'd be you. I would imagine you're looking at a top five linebacker core, but that's still a hop, skip, and a jump from where we stand today. Reality wise, we don't know what's yeah. going to happen with Miller. For all we know, that's a page that gets turned. Parsons, I'm a lot less sure about him as a first round guy for the Broncos at nine because of some of his. Let's say off field concerns and David. I'm all about Levante David. Like, if you can find a way to get Levante David here, ooh, go get it. I think it's going to be one or the other, though. They, they have way too many needs throughout the roster, including at, you know, backup or veteran quarterback. It's going to be either Parsons or Levante David, but I prefer Parsons to the younger guy, but I, I would love for the Broncos, regardless, to upgrade that spot. They cannot keep getting by anymore with the AJ Johnsons and the Josie Jewels. Von Miller's coming off an injury. Bradley Chubb is, you know, we still hold our breath when he pass rushes. So they need to sign someone dependable, whether that's Levante David or somebody else. But that inside linebacking core, they need a three-down player. So it's one or the other. I'd be happy with either. Hey, John, just an FYI, I'm going to grab this comment here. But uh, my chat just jumped to about 627 with Tyler is the closest one I have. And in between is is uh, David. We got Kenneth. So David, Oscar, Mike. Zachary, Muhammad, uh, those four superstars, FYI, I don't have access to them. So let's grab Anthony. Appreciate you being with us tonight, Anthony. He says, if Mac Jones, the Alabama quarterback, is still available in the second round, does Denver pick him up? So let me let me flush this out a little bit more, Zach. If the Broncos push to acquire a veteran like they're obviously trying to do right now and fail, all right, and then you get to the draft, and maybe they've signed a Andy Dalton or a Fitzpatrick or whoever, right, to be that number two, the backup, kind of push and compete with Locke. And they take a Parsons or they take a Caleb Farley at pick nine, and you get to the second round and Jones is still there. Is Could you see Peyton talking himself into taking a guy like Jones? Well, I think it's a moot point because realistically there's always one riser at quarterback in every draft, and it's going to be Mac Jones, I think, this year. And, you know, the first round, too rich for my blood. The second round, I still don't know. It depends on the commitment to lock, and it depends on what they do before the draft. I keep saying this. We will know what the Broncos' intentions are well before April, whatever it is, 29th this year, 30th, because if they sign a veteran quarterback, they're not going to take a young guy in the first or second round. So it's either one or the other. They sign Dalton, they're going to wait on a veteran or a rookie quarterback and not take Mac Jones. But regardless, I think he will be a first round pick. I wouldn't take him there, but a lot of Daniel Jones vibes, Chad, where it's just a high floor, dependable guy. He he likes everyone. The scouts love him. The coaches love him. And he's way overdrafted. That's where I see Mac Jones this year. I agree. I really don't think quarterback in the draft is on 
George Payton's to-do list. I think they'll scout the class, and if they do draft a quarterback, it's going to be a mid to late round guy. It's going to be pursue a veteran and Drew. David Kilgore, love you, my friend. Appreciate you. Bonafide superstar. He says, are there any decent corners in free agency this year? If so, do you guys see Denver going after any of them? I do think they're going to kick the tires on all of them. They're going to, I think Peyton's yeah. going to take a look because you don't just have one hole at corner. I mean, on, honestly, let's just for a second assume Bryce Callahan has never been hurt in his life, and you don't have to worry about that. Just for a second. You got OJ Mudia, who, if anything, is a rookie, kind of proved that he's a solid number three, probably still best served as a number four that you turn to if an injury befalls someone in the top three. But really, it's Callahan is the only guaranteed rock you can count on at corner. So you have two massive holes. You need three starter starting caliber corners at all times. I don't think A.J. Bouye is coming back to Denver. I think he's going to be one of those cap casualties. You free up whatever it is, 13, 14 million in so doing. But there's Patrick Peterson's probably the number one name out there on free agency. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what he is looking for in terms of a new contract and what teams are willing to pay him because he used to be the best corner. Uh, there was like a two- or three-year window there where he was the best man-to-man lockdown corner in the game. But he's really – he hasn't been the same dude the last few years. So any team that goes out there, Zach, and just shows him the money, I think are eventually going to rue that decision. You mean a veteran player declined under Vance Joseph? I'm shocked, Chad. He is not the same guy as he was. And the thing about Peterson, though, not that I think the Broncos will sign him because his market's going to be too high, but he can play safety as well. So it's almost like a Kareem Jackson situation where he kind of shifts to that role and you have the built-in replacement at safety. Um, the, the market after Peterson really falls off. It's a lot of like number two, number three guys, kind of like middling free agents. Um, Mackenzie Alexander is out there, former Viking. George Payton helped draft him. He knows him or he's familiar with him. Uh, Chidobe, Chidobe Awuzie, former Colorado, uh, state product, Colorado. I always get that confused. I don't know whether it's CSU or something. It Colorado. Yeah. So. He's not really a guy you want to count on, though, when you're replacing A.J. Boye. I do think, though, unlike inside linebacker, this is a position where the Broncos will double dip, whether it's a free agent and a draft pick or maybe two premium draft picks. Like Chad laid out, they need help desperately in that secondary. And I, you see after the list here, it's Peterson and then an older Richard Sherman and then an old Josh Norman and old Jason McCourty. You can sign that guy for depth, but don't count on that guy being a cornerback one for the length of the season. Yeah, there's no free agent corner that like, I mean, Xavier Rhodes maybe, but he's not exactly the greatest fit for Fangio. He's more of a man coverage, you know, press. he's like an Aqib Tlaib light, basically. I don't think he would necessarily be great in a Fangio scheme for what it's worth. Um, And by the way, the Spot Track website is just, it is a piece of crap because they have a lot going on on the site, which must, it just slows it down. So anytime I open it as a tab, just to show you guys lists and whatnot, Dude, it completely almost shuts down my browser because it's just it must just be taking up a ton of uh, ton of space. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Oscar, appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you. He says, I think fans just need to move on from the idea of Deshaun Watson. It's just not realistic without crippling the team's future. Other teams can offer more. Another topic here that he's he's got a great point. I said, look, the Rams deal, if that was Aaron Rodgers, I could understand it. What do you, what could you imagine? If if that's what Stafford could command, what in the Sam Hill are the Houston Texans going to be asking for in Watson's case? But it was brought up to me once again in this conversation with uh, Black Knight 232. Again, and I can, I couldn't disagree with him, Zach. Miami and New York, by virtue of the Jets, by virtue of, you know, they have a grip of, of ones over the next two drafts. Like they're actually in a position where they could separate from the rest of, of the competitors for Watson and make Houston an offer they couldn't refuse. But again, when you do that, you are yes, you're landing Deshaun Watson, but now you've got a team that is bereft <clears throat> of first, second, third round picks for at least the next two years, if not longer. I want to just give some credit to Woody Page because two days ago he heard from a what he called was a trusted source that said Stafford wants to go to a warm weather team and sure enough he went to a warm weather team and he said Deshaun Watson has no interest in coming to Denver and you know what if we listen to Woody on the first one he nailed it we have to it's worth paying attention for the second one why would Deshaun Watson choose Denver realistically 
you can look at the young weapons they have, but it's all theoretical upside. He want to go somewhere that's more proven. Reportedly, he wants to play for Robert Salah, the new Jets coach. The Broncos don't have that. Vic Fangio is not driving free agents into Denver. He's not a draw. Robert Salah, a player's coach, full of energy, the optimism, he is. Playing the Big Apple, uh, tons of cap space the Jets can play with. I think he will go there or Miami. But don't expect him, nor hold your breath, for a Watson trade to Denver. If they didn't give up more than a first for Matt Stafford, they're not going to trade for Deshaun Watson. That should have told you that. Mike Evans in the house, bona fide stud, bona fide superstar. Appreciate you, Mike. Great to have you in the stream, as always, my friend. He says, does our coaching staff help attract top free agent talent? Uh, I think it does for defensive guys. I think there's a – Fangio has a very um, you know, immaculate reputation – Deep on defense, there's a lot of guys out there who are free agents that are going to be hitting the market that have been in the league for at least four years, five years, and they've either gone against Fangio or they've played with guys who used to play with Fangio, and they've seen it. They know it. that's a recruiting tool for defensive guys, absolutely. Offense, when you're talking about skill positions, um, quarterbacks, it's a lot more murky, Zach, because A, Fangio has only won, what is it, 12 games in two seasons combined, and his offenses have been, through two seasons, bottom five, both times, bottom five offenses. So not a lot to incentivize offensive free agents to want to come here. First of all, ain't nobody coming to play for Pat Shermer. He's not a draw in the least. Uh, Vic Fangio, I-, I can you know reasonably ask you, Chad, or you know throw it out there, what free agent, other than Kareem Jackson, has he lured to Denver? What big-name free agent chose the Broncos, even on defense, over another team? I really, I know he hasn't been on the job for long, and last year was weird. I just don't think he's a draw. I think maybe leaving the Bears, his his status was at the highest. His value was at the highest in the NFL. And maybe free agents were thinking, okay, we come to Denver, we play with Von Miller, we build a monster. Well, after that first season, they went 7-9, and nine, and the, the air was let out of the balloon. And then last year, 5-10. and 10. People, free agents, if not for money, which the Broncos can't outdo other teams with, they want to come here to win. And they look at, for the most part, and they look at the Broncos who haven't really won anything since 2015. They're like, okay, I can go somewhere else. I don't see Vic Fangio being a draw. I don't see any coach on the Broncos roster, maybe Mike Munchak, being a draw for an outside free agent. It's just, it's what's so right now. For what it's worth, all right, Kareem Jackson is campaigning on Twitter for Deshaun Watson. Let me just show you guys this, all right? He, uh, 22 hours ago, he tweeted this or retweeted this from a, a random Broncos fan on, on Twitter that said, talk, uh, talk soon, K. Jack, of he and Deshaun Watson, former teammates in Houston, right? Uh, five in, after a game. And then there's, let's see, I, I see all the tweets. Just know I'm working on it with kind of a smiley-faced emoji. Um, and then here he is again, commenting with emojis on the whole Deshaun Watson thing. I don't think that's going to be much of a difference maker. Like Deshaun Watson's either attracted to Denver as a potential destination or he's not. If I were Deshaun Watson and I've made my mind up that I want out of Houston and I'm looking around, A, I don't understand why Robert Salah. Like, what are you talking about? Why do you want to go play for a defensive minded coach? I understand that he's, you know, he's got some juice and he's, his, his, you know, his reputation has grown quite a bit over the last few years as an assistant under. Kyle Shanahan, but why the Jets? Why Salah? There's nothing there for you to win out of the gates. Meanwhile, you look at Denver, you've got a defensive-minded coach similar to Salah that can kind of handle the defense, if you will, and every piece you could need on offense, from the receivers to the running backs to the tight ends, even the uh, offensive line, Zach. For now, the Broncos are committed 100% because of the salary cap to Jawan James. Like, you're – Locked in. You got every tool in the tool chest you would need in Denver right now. But to me, it still comes back to the coaching. Like the one disincentive if I'm Watson in my thought process is, ooh, I like all those tools and I like that supporting cast in Denver, but I'm not liking what I saw from the Shermer scheme last year. And, you know, the days of having Peyton Manning here, Zach, and him being the recruiting tool that has studs and all pros take less to play in Denver, 
there's nothing like that currently existing uh, for the Broncos. You mentioned it. His draw for the Jets, supposedly, it's got to be the coaching staff because in Houston, they try to appease him by retaining Tim Kelly. He's their offensive coordinator. He's a young, up-and-coming guy. Who did the Jets just hire? Mike LaFleur as their new OC. That is a draw for a young player. And that's why I said on KK earlier today, you can't have an old head coach and an old offensive coordinator. It's a young business. It's, it's been trending in that direction for a while. Robert Salah has a great reputation. He's, I think, 45 years old. Vic Fangio is 60. Pat Shermer is 59. They have Mike LaFleur. He's the brother of Matt LaFleur. He has a lot of cachet in his own, Chad. So that's appealing. It's the Big Apple. I'm sure Deshaun Watson is looking at the media aspect and all he can do for his own brand in New York as opposed to Denver. And Kareem Jackson, I don't like the message it's sending to Locke. I mean, he's still on your team, and you're out there advocating for an outside quarterback. I think he might know he's on the way out as well, Kareem Jackson. I think he's maybe trying to save face in the fan base or with the team. I... uh... (laughs) New York, the Jets, I mean, hey, man, RIP, because I know that was the team you grew up with. No disrespect. <laughs> we don't talk about it anymore. That's where quarterbacks go to die, all right? Like, if I'm Deshaun Watson, I get it that they have the capital to get me, but, like, I'm afraid, dude. We had Mark Sanchez for a while. I mean, he didn't die <laughs> there. He blossomed. And we yeah, had Chad Pennington. He didn't die there. He blossomed. But other than that, though, it's a, you're right. It's a wasteland. Ever since Joe Willie went like this, it's yep. been a wrap. Yep, they they used up all their football karma when he made that guarantee. (laughs) This is the Overtime Podcast Network. (laughs) All right, uh, Zachary Smouse in the house. Good to see you, my friend. Appreciate you. Bonafide superstar. He says, Chad, Zach, and Beast, thank you for uh, giving me inspiration in what you guys do. MHH was one of the best things that happened to me. Hashtag blessed. That's very sweet of you, my friend. We really appreciate that. And like I've said uh, on – previous pods it's been really cool to see to see you blossom if you will and start your own podcast and get your thing out there and so we uh we're like two proud uh surrogate parents over <laughs> zach and i two dads yes anything we can ever do please let us know we'd love to help out muhammad mhh male model in the house good to see you my brother and muhammad of course was also locked in along with many others uh that you guys know well for episode four of Kelberman's Corner today, which was phenomenal. Thanks to Muhammad and each one of you that were in the room that have subscribed and become official supporters on Facebook. You guys are sponsoring that show. All right. So we appreciate you. But Muhammad, he says, I'm tired of this notion that we are trading for a quarterback. Let's roll with Locke. If he doesn't work out, draft another one. And I, you know, like the, where I'll take it a step further than what Zach has said is, you know, Zach has said, look, I'm not telling you necessarily – it's lock in 2021 because that's what I want. I'm telling you that's the way the stars are aligned. Like that's just what it's probably going to be. I'll take it a step further and say, I do think it's in the De- in the Denver Broncos best interest to give lock one last year because you've gone this far with him. It, I would probably feel different Zach, if they had fired the coaching staff and started over with when right. they had and said, Peyton, go hire your own guy. And then, you know, let him basically, you got to trust what he wants to do, but because you kept the coaching staff in place, and you've wandered the desert two years now with Drew. You've put in that time. You put in that sweat equity trying to develop him. I want to see that through one last year. If you're giving Fangio one last year, if you're giving Shermer one last year, I want to see that with Locke. Doesn't mean you don't tinker. It doesn't mean you still don't, you know, hedge by going out and getting an Andy Dalton or a Fitzpatrick or whoever. But I still think it's for now, the way I'm sitting here, you know, January 31st, 2021. I still think it's in Denver's best interest to roll with Locke in 2021 because, Zach, he might end up popping. He might end up right. paying you back and and reinvest and reinforcing your investment. You're going, finally, we're getting returns. I mentioned this on KK today that if you're going to roll with the incumbent coaching staff and Fangio set himself up for failure, you know, hint, hint as to the topic of the show by retaining all the coaching staff. He didn't replace Tom McMahon. He didn't replace Pat Shermer after replacing Rich Gangarello the year prior. So when you had the incumbent coaching staff, you have to roll with the incumbent quarterback. It makes no sense for a first-year GM and a lame duck head coach to have a new quarterback come in. And again, you might not want to hear it. You might hate Drew Locke, and that's okay. But the Broncos, it's looking like are not going to make that big splash move for a quarterback that everyone is pining for. We're not saying they won't trade for one. We're not saying they won't acquire one. We're not saying even that they shouldn't acquire one. We're just telling you there's a lot more moves they can and will make other than blockbusters for Deshaun Watson or Matt Stafford. Let's get the barometer a little closer to reality. 
Tyler Randall, good to see you again in the chat stream, my friend. Really appreciate you. It's been great having you. He says, jumping in on my lunch break to show some love from Oklahoma. Broncos country is not a geographic location. It's a state of being, baby. It's wherever you are. He says, keep up the great work, guys. Going to catch the show tonight. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Hashtag state of being. Appreciate that, Thank Tyler. You, Tyler. Uh, let me see. Uh, BNS, I know we missed one of his supers the other night. There he is. Hey, you know, every once in a blue moon when we have a super active chat, one super chat will slip through the cracks. So BNS, you know, we we hated to, to see that after the fact. Of course, we don't realize it till after the fact. So uh, we want to make it up to you any way we can. He says, we need defense, fellas. Give Locke a full offseason to work on his game, draft two or three corners and a uh, and linebackers, remember, Zach, LOL, we have not – we have, if not the best, then the next <laughs> best left tackle in the league more than most have. Zach, that is another good point as far as a recruiting tool. You know, it's not going to necessarily be a deciding factor, but, like, it's just part of the picture, which is, you know, you have one of the best left tackles of 2020 anyway ready to block for your, and, and protect your blind side in Garrett Bowles. How many, though, outside of Denver know Garrett Bowles' name? Th- does he have a lot of NFL league-wide name recognition? I, I, again, it's not to take anything away from him, but I don't think having Garrett Bowles on the roster is going to make Andy Dalton sign here as opposed to another team or make Fitzpatrick sign here over another team. It's great to have, and the Broncos need to actually – use his coach, Mike Munchak, as more of the recruiting tool if they want to sign a right tackle or acquire a right tackle or recruit a right tackle coming out of the draft. Listen, we have the best in the business who used and made Garrett Bowles into what he is today. But Bowles on his face, I just I don't see him I don't see him having the cachet to draw free agents here, Chad, or or to uh make any difference overall. He's just a part of the he's a part of the puzzle. And if you're actually engaged in a recruiting process and you're able to communicate in any way, shape, or form with Watson or through the GM and the head coach of the Texans to get a message to Watson and say, look, you know, we've got left tackle solidified. You've got a guy for the next three or four years. Uh, finish your thought. I know you wanted to say something else. No, they, do. they say, okay, we have Garrett Bowles, but by the way, they whisper, we also have Juwan James. Don't tell anyone. So it's it kind of is bittersweet. Wait, wait, wait. I thought I heard a whoopee cushion somewhere. <laughs> um, no, that was me. <laughs> Jay Roper brings up, uh, what's up, Susie? Uh, Jay Roper brings up uh, Jared Goff and the Rams. Here's an interesting topic that I found myself. I was asking this myself last night as I wrote this article I was telling you guys about. And that is, it's a similar question to the whole Brady-Belichick paradigm. The the, the dynasty, the, the two-decade reign of the New England Patriots. Do, do we attribute it more to Bill Belichick and his coaching acumen, or do we attribute it more to Tom Brady. And I think at this point with Tom about to enter his 10th Super Bowl, we oh. have the answer there as far as which doesn't mean that they didn't need each other. There he is. Jay uh, also had the benefit of coaching. It doesn't mean that Belichick and Brady didn't need each other and that they, there wasn't a you know, symbiotic relationship there. But I think we know that the deciding factor in that relationship, it was always Brady. Now, let's look at that with regard to the Rams. Rams have won a lot of games since McVay landed. He took what was looking like a not so great pick of of Goff coming out of his rookie year that last year of Fisher. You know, he kind of made a fool of himself on hard knocks because he he well, I won't go down that road, but his and then his time late in the season when he finally got the chance to play it didn't go so well. In comes McVeigh. Instantaneously the Rams go from from zero to sixty. They're a factor. But I'm really curious to see coming out of this. Who was? I mean, McVeigh's tr- coaching tree just gets love after love every single year. You named it with the Lafleurs of the world. With um, what's the kid's name that just got hired for the Chargers? I'm having a break. Brandon Staley um, and more. All right, the it's there's a, Zach Taylor. All right, since he hasn't done anything yet, but nevertheless, that coaching tree is getting a lot of love. It's coveted around the NFL. Now we're going to get that answer. We're going to know really quick within the next year. Was it McVeigh or was it Goff? Which side of the pendulum wielded the most power when push came to shove in terms of producing the, the success that the Rams had over the last five years? Even Shane Waldron, I think he was the Rams passing game coordinator. He became the Seahawks' new offensive coordinator. So this McVeigh coaching tree chat is massive. And I'm going to always side with McVeigh over Jared Goff. And when you talk about a ceiling, I think they maximized Jared Goff's ceiling in Los Angeles. 
They had the talent around them. They had a good running game. They invested in wide receivers. They had young tight ends. They protected them well. They had a good defense. They had good coaching. That's where it falls on the quarterback. But when you have a ceiling, you, you keep hitting against it, and you can't go past it. You can't go past that ceiling. So they're hoping that when they can maximize or will maximize Matthew Stafford's ceiling, it's actually higher than Jared Goff's. But chicken of the egg, I'm siding with McVay uh, well before Jared Goff. Hey, John, before I grab uh, Nimbus here, <clears throat> Um, the stream jumped, and there was another one from Muhammad, Antonio, Meek, Fat Cats, and Black Knight, and David Kilgore that's in between that I don't have access to, so just FYI. Nimbus Productions, appreciate the super chat. This is a name we do not recognize, so thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Started tuning in last year, just showing some love. Hey, appreciate that. Connect with us on Twitter. We'd yep. like to be able to uh, shout you out after this show. If uh, if possible, while John's pulling up the other ones so that the stream jumped, let's grab Jason here. Appreciate you, Jason Christopher. Really come on strong of late, and uh, we see you. We appreciate you. He says several media outlets reported Peyton was hesitant to deal Locke for Stafford. Can you confirm if Locke was included in the proposed trade package? My understanding, all right, don't necessarily take this to the bank. My understanding of this, from what I've been told, is that Locke was part of what the Lions were interested in but it didn't stop there. All right. So when you hear that the Broncos were willing to offer a first round pick, a third lock, they also wanted one more guy. And like, that was a foundational, um, you know, young core guy, like a Noah Fant, a Jerry Judy, a Draymond Jones, maybe even a Bradley Chubb, that kind of a guy to go along with the package. And so I think, I mean, look, if you're going to, if you really were making a push that to get Matthew Stafford, you're willing to dispense with Drew Locke, for the privilege of landing Stafford because Stafford's your guy. You don't need Drew anymore. you got two years left on his rookie deal. If you're, if you're giving up all that capital to land Stafford, you sure as heck plan on having him under center for more than the next two years. So goodbye, Drew. I would be stunned if Peyton wasn't absolutely willing to give up Drew if it meant landing Stafford. But again, from what I understand, it was more than just Drew, and it was more than just a one, and it was more than just a three as well. God, if they would have gave up a couple sec- uh, first rounders and Locke and let's say Draymond Jones or Bradley Chubb, I would have been done, Chad. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, you do that for Deshaun Watson and maybe even not him. You do that for a Patrick Mahomes type player. And uh, I don't know, though. I can't confirm whether Locke was a part of the negotiations. All we've heard, though, is that uh, they've offered a first rounder and then some. It could be that they looked at the Broncos roster and they didn't want Locke. Maybe they wanted Bradley Chubb. Maybe they wanted Draymond Jones. Maybe they wanted. I don't know. You can't say Justin Simmons, he's not signed, but they don't have many assets, tradable assets. That's part of the reason why I believe they got a deal done with the Rams because the Rams were so willing to, to give up Jared Goff and his monster contract. Appreciate the very generous super chat, Muhammad. Really do. And we're looking forward to uh, meeting with you and talking with you on February 10th. It's going to be a gas. He says, MHH community, give yourself a favor and go to Facebook and become an MHH supporter. Kelberman's corner every Sunday, Five bucks a month. Trust me, you won't regret it. Zach, always on fire. Show Zach some love. Thank hey, you, Marvin. We, we, we're not uh, dealing some dollars to Muhammad for that <laughs> no. testimonial, for what it's worth. That's organic. So really appreciate that, Muhammad. And, yeah, guys, if you – you know, that's a this, this is a good opportunity to really quickly segue into uh, some quick, quick matters of business because we got to also tip our cap to who was one of our great partners over the last five months, which has been sportsbetting.com sponsoring this live stream podcast right now guys as you know gambling is legal in the state of colorado and if you want to make watching the super bowl or your favorite sports a little bit more interesting sportsbetting.com is your no-brainer destination for online gambling in colorado because you get sharp odds and low juice they have their own in-house bookmakers that means they're not a third party provider of odds what does that mean for you reduced juice Best prices, plus you get hassle-free bonuses that you can roll over after one time and 24-7 live customer support, and it's always a real person in the United States. But the kicker is this. Right now, after you make your first deposit, sportsbetting.com will double your deposit up to $300. That's $300 in free bet credits. So head on over to sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle, sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle, capitalize on up to 300 bucks in free bet credits. Help uh, help yourself start 2021 off on the right foot. 
All right, a couple of other quick things. We'll dive right back into the stream. Some great supers and questions and comments that I can't wait to get to. As this show continues to grow exponentially in MHH, again, guys, when we say we had over 2 million people reading milehighhuddle.com in the, this month of January, that's 2 million people. That's not 2 million articles read or whatever, page views. That's 2 million individual people reading the reading the, uh, the site. And we're so grateful for each one of you that have checked out our stuff and read every day and come back and comment. You come over here on the live streams, you follow us here, you engage, you support what we're doing, but you got to know how to connect with us as well on social media. And that's how we can keep the conversation going. Follow the pod on Twitter at huddle up pod, the main account at mile high huddle, my partner, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen and our producer, you know, him as Buona beast, but on Twitter at John K MHH. Also, a gentle reminder to check out the merch store, huddleuppod.com, and get your swag on. Get a dad hat like you see Zach wearing there, the MHH dad hat. Get a football priest hat like you see me wearing here. Face mask, mug, hoodie, little something for everybody. It's another way to support what we're doing here. And back to what Muhammad was talking about, become a supporter. It comes with some bennies. It comes from uh, with some benefits on Facebook. If you go to our page, facebook.com slash milehighhuddle, You'll see the big blue button says become a supporter. You click that you're in like Flynn. Or if you're watching right now, you're joining us on, on Facebook. If you scroll to the bottom where you would type in your comment, you're in the chat right next to that. You'll see a green icon. If you click on that icon, that takes you through signing up to become a supporter as well. Not only do you get access to Kelberman's corner out of the gates, which episode five will drop next Sunday. We just did episode four today with Zach and Kim, but we are dedicating more and more content and, and creating and planning out more and more content specifically for the Facebook supporting community. So check that out. It's easy to find. It's easy to get signed up and started. But if you're not in a position to do those things, we're seriously just stoked to have you in the stream or if you're listening after the fact as a on-demand podcast. But please do these three things. We ask that you subscribe on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. Like this video. Guys, you have no idea. If you're on YouTube or Facebook right now, Zach, we're pushing north of 500 people that are with us right now in this chat. If each one of you liked this video, it would have a huge effect on us, a beneficial effect on us organically. So like this video. And then the third thing is the the litmus test. If we're doing a good job for you, share this video out. We ask that you share it out there. Help us continue to grow and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. All right, John, let me see what else we got. A very, 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 very generous super chat from the queen of MHH. Christy is just, I mean, this times like this, she just blows us away, Zach. She's just, yeah. it's not the first time she's been this generous. And every time she does, it just, it just leaves me speechless sometimes. Christy, thank you so much. You know how much you mean to, to us and to this entire community. It's like discussing Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. You know, there's no more superlatives to talk about Christie's generosity and what she's done for the show. So thank you, Christy, so much. And it doesn't end here. You know, she's in the convers- She's in the chat, keeping the conversation going. She's on Twitter, keeping the conversation going. She's got her own podcast going. And so we just, you know, it's all uh, symbiotic. So, Christy, we appreciate you and, and everything you do for, for Mile High Huddle. Thank you. Love you. We got Ian Garrett on Facebook who wants to know, he says, the Broncos need an offensive tackle in the second round. I think we should draft the offensive tackle from Minnesota. Daniel, I, I always butcher his last name, Fa'ali. Um, he is awesome. I know that's a guy that Eric Trickle, if I'm not mistaken, likes quite a bit. But, Zach, it would not surprise me to see whoops, um, to see the Denver Broncos draft a tackle with one of the premium picks because you don't know what the future holds with James. Elijah Wilkinson – free agent, unrestricted. They're probably not bringing back DeMar Dotson, who's also unrestricted. You need to shore up some depth there because you don't know if he's going to show up for work, dude. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, they have to. You know, it's funny that we talked about the mock draft scenarios back in like October. We both said, no doubt about it, you know, right tackle has to be the Broncos' top pick. But that's kind of changed with the needed cornerback and needed inside linebacker. They have to invest in a top flight offensive tackle. They cannot keep holding their breath and, and, and depending on Juwan James, and if he decides that he has a you know a hangnail or a headache, he's going to bail out again. They have no one behind him. They have to go back on the scrap heap for someone like Demar Dotson. Not a first round need, maybe not a second round need, but beginning in the third round, they have to start looking for premium or blue chip to that point offensive lineman. 
All right, so Daniel Falili, Falili, I think is how you pronounce that. But yeah, he's uh, he's good looking tackle prospect out of uh, out of Minnesota. So uh, Antonio, thank you for that super chat, my friend. You are you're as as consistent as the day is long. Appreciate all your support, my friend. He says I'll be rooting for Locke until he proves he can't handle the starting position. I'm confident he'll put up huge numbers next year. I feel relatively confident as well. And here's why it's not just like, you know, blown smoke up anyone's skirt, so to speak. It's because he showed after some real dark moments, Zach, where he was regressing. I mean, it was like everyone alarmed from week 11 on, you, you got to kind of put aside that botched week 12 with the mask snafu that was just put that aside week 11, week 13, week 14, 15, 16, 17, Broncos didn't win all those games. It wasn't the dominant four and one type of finish like his rookie year, but he, as a player, as a quarterback, as a game manager, as a decision maker, as a playmaker, all those components, he took massive steps forward in those final games. And so that leads me to believe that you give this kid the off season, you give him the playbook two years in a row, you could see him take some steps forward. How big are those steps? Are they quantum leap level steps? Time will tell. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely true. It's like the matter of the steps, not really the steps taken. But I like the way the question was posed to us. I'm going to root for him until he's demonstrating that he can't handle the starting job. And I don't think anything he's done to this point, even with his turnovers, his bad play last year, has said, you know what, for a certainty, Drew Locke cannot be the franchise quarterback. Obviously, he's very up and down. Obviously, things worked against him, and, and he didn't help himself either. But that's why I'm still holding steadfast to my belief George Payton wants to see, maybe with a better quarterback behind him, what he can do, lock one more year in a make-or-break third season. All right, so Marshawn Lattimore on the brain for a lot of of people, including one of our great listeners and superstars, Meek555. Good to see you, brother. Appreciate you. He says, realistically, do you think we can trade for Mark Sean Lattimore? What are your thoughts on that? Because as far as I know – the, the Saints aren't necessarily intent on trading him. Like, that's not a decision that's fully been made. But if you're a team that wanted to make a push to land him, maybe that's, you know, they'll pick up the phone and listen. Well, the whole thing is, the argument is that the Saints are so over the cap. I think they're like $90 million over the cap. And you have to be under the salary cap that they're going to have a fire sale and they're going to get rid of their top players. I don't see that happening, nor would I want Marshawn Lattimore, even for – what, a second-round pick, third-round pick? Just draft Caleb Farley. Younger player, maybe higher upside, much cheaper, and you can you can still maintain another draft pick. You don't have to give up another pick and a contract. So, no, draft the guy. Don't don't trade for him. All right, let's see here, John. Fat Cats, Black Knight, David, if you have them, and then uh, we're, we'll end up being caught up to where I'm at in the stream. Steve Baumgartner, good to see you, bro. Appreciate you. He says, can't wait to be on the pod next Monday. Steven's going to make an appearance on uh, Monday's show, not tomorrow night, though, the one after, uh, for his birthday. We're going to, we're going to sing, we're going to get a birthday cake. All right. We're going to sing him happy birthday. All right. And then we're going to wish him a good night. So, Steven, yeah, it's going to be a gas, my friend. We look forward to seeing you. It's going to be really, really fun. John Juno on Facebook with an interesting point. You touched on this, Zach, but I think it's worthy. You know, we're at 52 minutes, so we kind of got to hurry here. But is Kareem Jackson taking a shot at Locke by openly campaigning for Deshaun Watson on Twitter. I wrote last night, real quick, that Drew Locke sees that the Broncos wanted Stafford. They see that they were at least in on those talks. If you're Jay Cutler in 2009, coming off your one Pro Bowl season as a Bronco, your last year in Denver, it's your Pro Bowl year. You were top five quarterback in the league that year. You have the juice to go, hey, that offends me. either make it up to me or I'm out of here. Like I want out. Locke doesn't really have that kind of juice. And then he sees his teammate openly campaigning for him to be replaced. It can't be good for him, but he can either take that in stride and go, gosh, dang, I need to get motivated and and prove to my boys that I'm the guy or he withers into a ball, curls up and dies. What do you think happens? 
Well, I'm going to give Kareem Jackson the benefit of the doubt and say he's kind of just pandering to the popular take right now, which is get Watson to Denver and any means necessary. I used to play in Houston, so let me see what I can do. Kareem, you're not doing anything. You're not going to change Deshaun Watson's mind if he wants to play for the Jets or San Francisco or Miami. So I think it's pandering to his audience, and I think kind of save his own behind. He knows he's a potential cap casualty. What better way to endear himself to the front office and the fan base by campaigning for for Deshaun Watson. Well said. Fat Cats, appreciate you, my friend. Just spitting hypotheticals, if Watson went to Indianapolis, would you take Jacoby Brissett as an effective backup for Drew this year? I would. I mean, I think he's one of the guys, if I'm looking at like five options to back him up and not only be kind of a push, you know, compete, create some competition anxiety, but also a guy you could probably trust to keep you com- competent and competitive if you have to bench lock or if he goes down. And going down, look, that's a con- legit concern for Drew Luck. Two years in the league, two serious injuries that cost him time on the field. So it wouldn't be my first choice, Zach Brissett, but I wouldn't hate yeah. it. Yeah, you mentioned five choices. He'd be my fifth on that list. I- I've never gotten the whole allure of Jacoby Brissett. I understand he took over for Andrew Luck. I understand he's – from the Patriot system, but is he really better than what maybe Brett Rippon can do or Jeff Driscoll, God forbid? Uh, if they're going to get a veteran quarterback that is aimed to push Locke or keep the Broncos competitive, if something happens to Locke or he bombs, Brissett to me is not that guy. You know, it's a very kind of slim market. None of these names are very appealing for the long term Dalton or Fitzpatrick, but I would take those two guys well before I would gamble on Brissett as the backup or bridge starter. David Kilgore. Appreciate you, bro. Again, he says if Denver does go with Locke in 2021 and tanks again, what quarterback do you guys see us either drafting or in free agency? I'm not sure who the free agents are going to be next year, but again, guys, there's no such thing as a franchise, a free agent franchise quarterback. So it would really come down to the draft. And I mean, who knows? No one could have foreseen a blockbuster, unprecedented golf for Stafford trade. <clears throat> no one this time last year could have foreseen that. Deshaun Watson, a player of his caliber, would be trying to strong arm his way out of Houston. So much could shift and change between now and then in terms of the veteran market, Zach. But I think if you're turning the page and lock didn't work and the and you're firing Fangio, it's all about the draft. And uh, I'm not even sure who some of the top 2022 QB uh, prospects are. All I do know is what I've been told from experts like Nick Kendall, Eric Trickle, those guys. It's not a great quarterback class, at least sitting here where we are right now. Well, I got a name in the veteran class for 2022, and it's three letters, D-A-K. And 2020, and just saying, guys, I'm still holding on hope. He gets the franchise tag again this year. He would be a free agent in 2022. And if Locke doesn't bomb, they would have a new head coach. And maybe that head coach, Chad, is Eric Bieniemy. Maybe that head coach, Chad, is Kellen Moore in 2022. And Dak Prescott's a free agent. That is my guy. So I agree with what Chad is saying. There's no franchise quarterbacks except for Peyton Manning as the outlier on the open market. But if Dak were to become available next year, he is the guy I'm throwing big money at with the new rookie head coach that's offensive-minded. It's a perfect pairing. All right, let me see here. Uh, John Houston, thank you for that super chat, my friend. He says, um, I could see Denver getting Tr- uh, Mitchell Trubisky to back up Locke, to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised either just because Fangio has a little experience with him. But if you think a guy like Trubisky is coming into Denver to, um, you know, offer salvation to this franchise you got another thing coming like dude <laughs> that was a mistake from the get the chicago bears and he's already he reached his ceiling in 2018 and then ever since careened boom b- bounced off the ceiling and been going <laughs> like a torpedo yeah i don't want anything to do with trubisky i think he's damaged goods and his rushing upside doesn't warrant i think the the negative headlines the broncos would receive by signing him so a safer bet not a sexy bet but a safer bet is someone like andy dalton or fitzpatrick i think that's the way to go uh we've got rollo rello takeover again thank you my friend connect with us on twitter if you have a twitter account reach out and let us know who you are so we can connect there keep the combo going he says, any expectations from the Senior Bowl game yesterday? Look, I don't uh, – a lot of people think it's all about the game. It's really not. Like the evaluation, the work that gets done on these seniors going into the draft, it's not about the game. It's about the whole week of practice. Like I was surprised, Zach, when I covered the Senior Bowl in 2015. Flo- I fly in, 
And in fact, when I'm making the arrangements, right, I'm booking my flight, I'm booking my room. When do I fly in? When do I fly out? Everyone's telling me at the network, hey, no, you fly out Friday. I'm like, the game's Saturday. What are you talking about? No, 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 you're flying out Friday. I'm like, what are you talking about? Turns out no one cares about the game. The only people that stick around and watch the game are television, broadcast media. All the scouts, everyone else, they hightail it on, on Friday. They get out of there because all the work has been done. They're there to talk to the coaches, see how these guys practice, watch them in one-on-ones, talk to each other, get the buzz, networking and all that. So the, the, the work has been done long before the game. What I'll tell you is that Mac Jones significantly improved his draft stock. He, I think he already had better stock than people realized, but I think the senior bowl helped him improve it a little bit more. There's a center, there's a tackle, there's a, there's a safety that I know Lance Sanderson um, it wrote about that's coming out here tonight or in the morning at milehighhuddle.com that you can check out. There are quite a few prospects, and I know that Luke Patterson, who was there for us covering it for Mile High Huddle representing the brand all week long, he's got some articles, some content coming down the pike this week that's going to be detailing exactly the answers to those questions. And Black Knight, appreciate you, my friend means a lot on uh, on Twitch. Yeah, Mac Jones got kind of criticized for whatever reason for not playing in the actual game, but he did what he had to do during the week, Chad. He, like you said, he he bumped his draft status up. Agree with it or not, from the second round, arguably to the fringe first round, the top, you know, the bottom half of the first round. So he did what he had to do, and the Broncos, whatever scouts were there, they got to see the players that they intended to see. Damian Clark Warren, wow, that's wow. an extremely generous super, my friend. Just seriously blows us away and you've been with us a long time man it's not the first time you've shown that uh level of of generosity and support so thank you so much my brother really means a lot to us he says i had some time for the live show for a chance to show my favorite pod some love appreciate you what do you think about the speed of our inside linebackers and the defense overall every super bowl we won our team speed on defense was really Good. That's a uh, excellent point, my friend. It's one of the things that the Broncos, let's be honest, they have to upgrade that, Zach. At the second level, linebackers, I mean, you've got a, a pair of competent NFL linebackers. Neither one are fast. Your corners aren't particularly fast. you got a good pair of safeties if you can keep Simmons around. We'll see what happens with Kareem. But speed is definitely something lacking on the second level and parts of the third level. So I think that's something Peyton looks at and goes, I, I obviously can see where we need some sincere upgrades, whether it comes through free agency or the draft. That's one of the reasons I, I know he's getting a little longer in the teeth. All right. But Levante David to me is a guy you go out and see if you can't get him here. And the great thing is about the Vikings, he always had dynamic linebackers for the most part in Minnesota, whether it's Kendricks or Eric Wilson. So that's it leads me to believe they have to upgrade that front. And we've been saying for as much attention as the offense should be getting, you know, right tackle or quarterback, maybe a backup tight end. They need to invest heavily in restocking cupboards on defense in the secondary and inside linebacker. Certainly. Black Knight 232. Appreciate the super, my bro. He says, you've just been hired as the next Broncos GM. What do you do? Hit the reset button, clean house and build from the ground up or flex seal the holes that appear in the boat. Really good question. So first of all, I don't take the job unless I have control of the coaching staff and right. the, the entire personnel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but now that I, if I'm Peyton and I did take the job, what do I do? I mean, I'm riding out 2021, but in a perfect world, Jeremy, I am taking the job only if I can choose my coach. And who knows? Maybe Peyton really did think Vic Fangio to use his own word. He said, this is an exceptional coaching staff. Maybe that's not just a talking point, Zach. Maybe he truly believes that. But I don't think so. I think that was the one of the conditions that was foisted upon him. Here's a great organization with a storied history, a lot of the pieces in place. But the one downside that you got to accept, at least in the short term, is 2021 belongs to Vic Fangio. And honestly, it's fine because Peyton's got six years, man. And it's no skin off his teeth. If Vic Fangio falls on his face in year three, then he gets to start over and he's still got five years left as GM. He can hire his own coaching staff. He can go get his quarterback. But it's a moot point at this point at this stage. I, to answer the question hypothetically, I would look at what George Payton is doing in practicality. I like the way he's going about his first year as GM. You can't blow everything up when you're saddled with a lame duck coach and his lame duck coaching staff. So it's bide your time with Elway still in the building. Ellis still in the building. George Payton, his tenure really doesn't start until 2022. 
So if he's giving it one more year with Fangio, he's on scholarship, it's his honeymoon, whatever you want to, however you want to call it, if Fangio doesn't cut it, he will fire him and fire Shermer and fire the coaching staff and fire the quarterback and bring in everyone where he wants his guys to be in. All right, John, real quick. Uh, we've got one from Zeus, Blue Rob, Base Gase, Muhammad, Team Jokic, and Kenneth Booker, none of which I have access to, so I can – I can grab them. But in the meantime, while you're putting those together, um, Orange Crush on Twitter, appreciate you being with us. Zach, what are your thoughts on going out and trying to land Gardner Minshew? Tell tell them why. I've never seen a guy with more hype that's less deserving. What has Gardner Gardner Minshew done ever since, ever besides grow a mustache? I I don't understand the accomplishments in Jacksonville that Minshew had. He won a few games a couple years ago. Big deal. So did Locke. He went four and one in 2019. I don't understand the hype. I don't think he's that great. I think the he's a bigger fan of himself than I think a lot of the outside world world is in him. So no, I don't want him on the Broncos. Give me Andy Dalton, a safer choice, a better quarterback, and that's that. Look, Gardner Minshew is a dynamic personality. He's a very intense cat. Uh, I can understand he has some magnetism to him, but he's very limited quarterback. So. Uh, his that caught up to him really, really quick. Zeus, love you, buddy. Everyone knows Zeus McPeak. First, first, uh, you know, outline etched in MHH Mount Rushmore. Zeus has been propelling us along from the moment we turned our podcast into a live stream. And we just love you, bro. Good to see you. It's not the same when you're not in the chat. So good to see you, bro. That's right. Thank you, Stu. Hope all is well. Uh, Blue Rock, Chris, and we got a rapid fire because we're about five minutes over the one hour mark here. Appreciate you, Chris. He says, no hard-hitting questions today, just saying hi. My high salute to you, Doc. Appreciate that. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Blue Row. Uh, let's see. Based Gase, love you, bro. Good to see you. And by the way, when are you going to get a Twitter account, Doc? Get a Twitter account so we can keep the conversation going. He says, continuity for continuity's sake feels like we are wasting a year. Rip the Band-Aid. Let's rebuild this team now, not in 2022. I feel you. You know, and my philosophy on Drew would maybe be a little bit different, as I mentioned earlier, if they had said, look, Peyton, you're hired, do what you want to do. And he says, all right, new coach, no new coaching staff, and I got to get my quarterback. I'd, I, I would have been a lot more behind it as a, as a prospect, but they didn't do that. They're keeping Fangio. So it's, it just, to me, makes more sense to, to run it back one last year with Locke. And then, you know, yeah. all the answers are there and you can either – know that you've got, you found your guy, you stuck it out. That one last year of patience was worth it. Or now we know for sure we can put that to bed. Let's start over. I said that the number one question the Broncos have to answer in 2020 was, is Locke the guy or is he not the guy? And the answer is still unknown. It's an incomplete, you know, question that he hasn't answered yet. And I think George Payton wants to you know, see the end of that. He wants to see the end of Locke's development. He wants to see if he can win with him. But like Chad said, I think one of the conditions, and I'm just speculating, I think one of the conditions of George Payton being hired was Ellis and Elway said, Fangio is going to be around this year. You're going to have to take this coaching staff. You're going to have to take his coordinators. You're going to have to take most of his players, including number three. And there's a reason why George Payton leapt finally from Minnesota and to finally take that GM job that was an understanding that I believe was in place. So anyone holding on hope, that was, I think, always the plan going in, even before Elway stepped down. I mean, Peyton will have some options if he does have to reboot next year, hiring a new head coach. You got Eric Bieniemy will be available. You could go get a Brian Dayball. And who else? The other guys might emerge between now and then. Plus, More. you know, at the quarterback level, there's some names like Sam Howell, um, Spencer Rattler off the top of my head. There are some options that I don't love, but – by the time you get get there, it might it might shift because before a year before the twenty twenty draft, for example, or yeah, a year before that, no one would have guessed that Joe Burrow was going to be a dynamic, arguably put up one of the greatest college uh, quarterback seasons of all time, go on to be the number one pick. Someone could emerge. What was that one for Muhammad there, John? Appreciate you, bro. And he says, shout out to the beast. Show the beast some love. Beast, we're not worthy. John, John is the shiznit. All right. <laughs> At John K M H H guys, give him a follow team. Uh, pre- dude, thank you for, for being here. He says, uh, John, remember this, bro. I'm going to try and can I copy that? I'll copy it. 
He says, my Twitter is at K-H-R-I-S-B-E-T-H-1, so we can talk after the show, et cetera. Anyways, okay, good to know. If Vaughn doesn't take a pay cut, do you think he's gone? Same with Bouye and Casey. So Bouye and Casey, to me, Zach, unless they're willing to take pennies on the dollar, gone. See ya. Vaughn, though, it's a little more delicate than just simple dollars and cents. Like, you know, you have the legacy of one of the greatest players to ever suit up in, in orange and blue to consider. Plus, he's under criminal investigation from Parker Police in Colorado. Plus, you you got to find out what's up with his ankle. Is he truly healthy? I mean, there's so many factors that that's just a separate a separate argument. But I still think Bouye and Casey, I mean, I'd be stunned if Peyton holds on to either. Yeah, and the thing about Vaughn is the the criminal investigation, which the details are still pretty scarce on, that couldn't have been more fortuitous for George Payton. That gave him a potential out. That gave him plausible deniability. If that investigation goes sour, it goes south, he can say, listen, he's not worth it. We're going to cut him on these grounds. But before that, you couldn't really cut him on that because he didn't play last year. He's still a future Hall of Famer. I'm still believing. I think no news is good news for Vaughn. I think that was a domestic situation that hopefully is resolved. And then when that comes out and he's cleared, the Broncos will then turn to his contract. But I happen to think in my heart of hearts, he'll restructure or the Broncos will find a way to keep him for this season. Beyond that, anyone's guess. By the way, uh, Team Jokic, I just searched for that handle you put as your Twitter. There, It shows me that there is no such account. So maybe there's a typo there. Put it in the chat. Uh, and we'll keep an eye on that. Kenneth Booker, love you, bro. He says, if Locke stays healthy, what is his ceiling stat-wise? I mean, let's just dial it back to this time last year where we got questions similar to this. <laughs> I saw if he had – if all the stars aligned for Drew, I saw in 2020 somewhere between 22 and 25 or 6 touchdowns as a ceiling, somewhere approaching 4,000 yards, something like that, all right? And I think for now, even if he does turn the corner and turns out to be everything fans hoped he could be, I think for the next two or three years, even under that parameter, that's about the ceiling that I would expect him to see. Now, a lot of quarterbacks, they hit one ceiling, and you go, all right, we think we know how good this guy is and can be, and then they bust through to a whole other level, and that's the true great guys that end up you know, becoming dominant. So for now, though, I think that's that's it. I think he's a guy whose ceiling, if all the stars align, he's a 20 20- two to 26 touchdown guy and around 4,000 yards. He's got the skill positions to do it. Does he have the offensive coordinator? Does he have the right quarterbacks coach? Does he have all the pieces himself? We don't know yet. And I don't want to get hung up too much on passing yards because 3,200 yards is just 200 yards a game for 16 games. So if he averages 300 yards, that'd obviously be, you know, uh, 4,800. That's a little on the, on the high end. I think of what Locke can do, but like Chad just said, better play calling, better management, and better uh, play on luck on Locke's behalf can get him to that four thousand mark. Maybe twenty eight touchdowns, you know, maybe in a in a year of lock, thirty touchdowns with this supporting cast. But they don't need that. If he's four thousand yards, twenty eight touchdowns, the Broncos are a playoff team. That's all they need from Drew this year. All right, Christian, I did find you. Thank you for the correction. There, I just connected with you, so. All right, guys, that's going to do it for tonight's episode of the Huddle Up podcast. Thanks to each and every one of you. Oh, wait, John's giving me the finger. (laughs) Not that finger. He's going like this. Wait, wait, BNS. Love you, bro. Says thanks, guys. Uh, And love Kelberman's Corner. Thank you. Keep it up. Hashtag all pro bowls. The bowls new service. Love you, buddy. (laughs) Appreciate you. And again, to you and to Joshua Shadow 3, we're sorry we we missed your super the other night. It's a rarity. It happens every once in a blue moon, but we always try to make it up to you. But uh, Follow the pod on Twitter, gang, at HuddleUpPod, the main account, at Mile High Huddle, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself, at Chad and Jensen. And I want to show you guys something here because I think sometimes the uh, Twitter account gets lost in the shuffle. People don't understand exactly how it's spelled. So I'm going to lay this out for you real quick, how to connect with Buona Beast on Twitter because you're doing yourself a disservice if you're on Twitter and you're not following him at John K M H H. All right, there it is. And then um, check out the merch store, boys and girls, when you get some time, huddle up get your swag on. We'd love to have you under the, the same tent with us for Kelberman's corner every Sunday. If you want in on that, go to facebook.com slash mile high huddle, click the big blue button, become a supporter and uh, shout out to Manscaped. Go get your 20% off and free shipping. Code HUDDLE, manscaped.com. 
Shout out as well to sportsbetting.com, who have been a great partner and sponsor for this show for the last five months. Go get uh, $300, up to $300 in free bet credits. Sportsbetting.com slash Mile High Huddle. Muhammad, thanks for that sticker, my friend, on the way out the door. We're seriously stoked to, to see you on uh, on February 10th. It's going to be it's going to be a gas. So, all right, guys, we uh, we got to dip out. Zach, sign us off, bro. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, hopefully, or you know, maybe possibly, we'll have more on the quarterback front. You know, more on the Broncos' reported trade offer to Detroit. Maybe more on the Deshaun Watson a potential trade. So, we're looking forward to starting a new week of podcasting, Chad. We'll tune in tomorrow night to join us, six o'clock Mountain Time, eight o'clock Eastern. Be there, and until next time, and as always. Go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.